Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that I've been following since it went to trial. I watched the entire case unfold and let me tell you, I am torn. Those of you who regularly watch my videos know that I am not sympathetic when it comes to the insanity plea. In fact, most of the time, I think it's a load of BS. But this is the first case in a long, long time where I've actually questioned whether I think insanity is the appropriate explanation here. This is one of those cases that I really want you all to share your thoughts on because I truly think that everybody is going to feel differently about this case. With that being said, let's just jump right into it. Brenda Powell was born on March 19th, 1969 in Salem, Ohio. She attended the University of Akron, Ohio before graduating and going on to work as a child life specialist in the hematology oncology unit at Akron Children's Hospital, where she worked for 28 years. At the hospital, it was basically Brenda's job to work with the sick children and their families to help guide them through the process of the hospital treatment and everything that came with it. Brenda was described as being a very quiet and soft spoken person, but she was incredibly caring towards everyone in her life, but especially towards the children and families who she worked with at the hospital. She founded the Oncology Teen Program at the hospital, and she planned activities for families and helped them celebrate even the smallest victories within their children's treatments. She truly went above and beyond for her patients. Her care allowed patients and families to form such close bonds with her that could last a lifetime. She was cherished by her co-workers and patients alike. By November of 1996, Brenda would go on to marry Stephen Powell, who she was introduced to by a mutual friend that was also a co-worker of Brenda's at the hospital. Throughout their 24 years together, they went on to have two children, a daughter named Sydney and a son named Andrew. Their daughter, Sydney, was known as loving sports growing up. She played soccer from the time that she was old enough to walk all the way through her senior year of high school. Brenda would make it a point to go to each and every one of Sydney's games to cheer her on on the sidelines. Both Stephen and Brenda were known as being the best parents that they could possibly be, always putting their children first. Their family was always the most important thing to them. Stephen, Brenda, and the family would watch football every Sunday while the children were growing up, although Brenda was never a huge fan. When Sydney got older, the boys would continue watching their football while Sydney and her mother would go shopping together. The two were said to have an especially close bond. People who knew them said that Sydney was Brenda's mini-me and Brenda was Sydney's best friend. Sydney was known as being an excellent student. She excelled in high school with her lowest grades being a B. She graduated high school with a 3.8 GPA, and because of that, Sydney went on to attend Mount Union University with a scholarship. While there, she had one of her close friends from high school as a roommate, which is always one of the best case scenarios, having someone that you already know who came to college with you and is now your roommate. Sydney also joined a sorority while there, and by all accounts, things were going great for her. Those around Sydney described her as being social, charismatic, and bubbly. She completed her freshman year and spent her summer break hanging out with friends, going shopping, and having a fun time while enjoying her break from school. However, things seemed to take a turn for the worst that following year. According to her roommate, things seemed normal during their first semester of sophomore year. However, after completing their fall semester of sophomore year, Sydney told her roommate that she was going to be moving away from campus to get some time to herself and figure things out. But her roommate wasn't exactly sure why she was doing this. But it turned out that Sydney was not doing well in school at all. During that first semester back, she was placed on academic probation. The hope was that Sydney would really buckle down and get her grades up, but she didn't. She actually failed three of her four classes that fall semester. Because of this, Sydney received notice that she would be expelled from school, saying that she would be allowed to reapply after that spring semester was over. This was a notice that was returned and signed by Sydney, so she knew that she needed to leave. But despite this, in early January of 2020, when the spring semester started back up, 19-year-old Sydney continued to act like everything was normal. 
She continued to attend sorority meetings. She moved back into the dorm with her roommate and continued hanging around campus, telling her roommate and friends that she was still going to class. Because of this, by late January to early February of 2020, an official from the school, Michelle Gaffney, met with Sydney personally to let her know that she was no longer welcome at the school and that she needed to pack up and move out of her dorm, adding that her keycard access would be terminated. They offered to help her with moving and even offered to speak with her parents about what was going on so that she could make this transition smoothly. But Sydney assured the school that she was going to move out, that her parents already knew and that they were helping her with everything. But even so, Sydney did not want her family to find out that she had failed out of school. Instead of being honest and explaining what happened, she hid from her family. She continued to tell her family that her grades were doing well, that she had her scholarship, and things were going about as well as you could expect. Now, after being kicked off of campus, she did leave, but she didn't go home. During the weeks of mid to late February, she stayed at different hotels. On the 25th and 26th of February, she stayed at a local Comfort Inn, and then a few more days at a Red Roof Inn. She paid cash for these hotel stays so that they wouldn't show up on her credit card statements. And during that time, Sydney was on her computer making numerous Google searches about how to make money so that she could afford to continue living in these hotels. But as we will see, it doesn't seem like she was able to make money to continue living the way she was. She also stayed with friends as well during this time, but she did not want to return home. So she would switch back and forth between a friend's house or hotels, all to avoid going home and facing her parents. Meanwhile, Sydney continued texting her mother about school, making her believe that she was enrolled in classes, even though she wasn't. She would talk about the classes she was taking, what she was doing, and what she was learning. But Brenda and Stephen started to notice a change. They started to notice that Sydney would be at home while they thought she was supposed to be at school. During her first years, she was never usually home, so it was weird that all of a sudden, she was spending so much time at home now. Now, I want to note that the Powell family all used an app called Life360. This is a GPS tracking app that tracks different members of the family, basically like Find My Friends on iPhone. Families will sometimes use this app to keep track of their children and make sure they're safe and where they're supposed to be. All of the members of the Powell family have this on their phones so Brenda and Stephen could see where Sydney was and Sydney could see where her brother was and where her parents were. By February 25th, 2020, Brenda texted Sydney saying that she got a notification from Life360 that she had been at home all afternoon. Brenda was at work at this point, so she asked Sydney if she was in class. Sydney responded to her mom saying that she had the week off from school, that her teacher and her husband went out of town that week, only giving the students a worksheet to fill out that week while they were gone. They continued talking about school, but it seemed that Brenda was starting to get suspicious. That same day, Brenda texted Sydney saying, quote, why do I feel like you're scamming me? Just remember, you need the grades to keep your scholarship. To which Sydney replied, quote, Yes, I know. My grades are good. Thank you very much. By March 2nd, she texted her mom again, telling her that she was going to be done with school by 2.30 p.m. that day. And after that, she would be going to a friend's place to watch The Bachelor. It was Monday, so it was Bachelor Day with the girls. At that same time, she was texting her friend about their plans, once again, acting like she was still in school and things were A-OK. -okay. While at her bachelor get-together, friends say that Sydney was acting her normal, bubbly, happy self. Now, at the same time, the other weird thing that her parents noticed was that the money from her tuition was never withdrawn from Stephen's bank account because they were the ones helping her pay for her tuition. So, by the morning of March 3rd, 2020, Sydney's father, Stephen, was at work when he went online to the school's payment portal to pay Sydney's tuition. But he wasn't able to access the portal anymore. He didn't know why at first and tried calling Sydney and the school to straighten things out. But then he went on that Life360 tracking app and realized that Sydney was actually at home when she was supposed to be at school. He sort of put the pieces together, and that is when Stephen realized that something was going on here. So, at around 11 a.m. that day, Stephen left work to go home and talk to Sydney. 
in doing so, he actually left his phone at work so that Sydney wouldn't be able to look on the Life360 tracking app and see that he was coming. He didn't want to give her a chance to run away before he got the chance to talk to her. Because once again, he tried calling her and she was avoiding answering, so he wanted to make sure he could get home and actually get her before she left. When he got home, he did confront Sydney about the whole situation. At this point, Sydney confided in Stephen that she wasn't doing well in school. She didn't like school, and she didn't feel like she belonged at Mount Union, leaving out the fact that she had already failed. So she did kind of sprinkle the truth in, saying that she wasn't doing well, but she avoided saying that she had already failed. So Stephen reassured Sydney. He said that he was going to tell Brenda what happened, saying that they were going to work together to find a solution. He said that she can take some time off of school, take the summer to work, and save up some money before she needed to return back to school that fall semester. They seemed to have a mutual understanding, so after this conversation, Stephen left and went back to work. However, although Stephen didn't show Sydney how frustrated he was, this whole situation made Stephen very upset. So, once he was back at work, he texted Brenda about what he just learned. He was kind of freaking out at that point, but Brenda was trained at de-escalation techniques as this was part of her job, so she was very skilled at dealing with such stressful matters like this. So, they discussed that Brenda would go home and talk to Sydney and get things figured out in a calm manner. After learning about what happened, Brenda called Mount Union to discuss Sydney's standing at school. She didn't get an answer at first, so she left the school a voicemail asking them to call her back whenever they got the chance. This voicemail went to school officials Michelle Gaffney and John Frazier. About an hour passed as Brenda left work and returned home to speak with her daughter about school. Michelle and John called her back at around 12.36 p.m. When speaking with Brenda, she appeared calm and normal. She didn't seem stressed or like she was in the middle of something or in the middle of some heated argument with Sydney. But as they all spoke on the phone, all of a sudden they hear a scream before hearing the sounds of six or seven thuds, one after the other, thud after thud after thud. That was until the call randomly dropped. Of course, hearing this immediately concerned Michelle and John. So, they tried calling Brenda back multiple times, all without an answer. That was until one of the calls was answered at 12.40 p.m. by somebody introducing themselves as Brenda. But seeing as how they literally just got off the phone with Brenda, they knew that the person on the other end was not Brenda. It was Sydney. So they said, I know this is you, Sydney, before the phone hung up once again. At this point, they were very concerned about Brenda's well being. So they contacted the Akron Police Department to request a welfare check at the Powell home. Now, the police chief in Akron was actually familiar with the Powell family, he was friends with Brenda and Stephen. So when he heard that police were heading there, he gave Stephen Powell a phone call to check in and see if things were okay. Of course, when Stephen got this call, he was surprised and confused. He didn't know of any issues, saying that Brenda and Sydney were at home and he was at work. Then he hangs up and starts calling Brenda and Sydney to check in on them. All the calls to Brenda go to voicemail, and the first few calls to Sydney go to voicemail as well, but she does eventually pick up. Stephen asked her what was wrong, and Sydney said nothing that Brenda, her mom, was on the phone and that this is why she wasn't answering. But then Stephen informed her that police were on the way and asked why. At this point, Sydney became hysterical with her dad. She started crying and saying that there was actually an incident. There was a break-in. After that, the call ends suddenly. By the time officers arrived, Sydney was hysterical. She opened the door for officers and started telling them that there had been a break-in. She was covered in blood at that point, still hysterically crying and trying to explain that her mom was hurt and that there was blood everywhere. And as the attack was happening from this robber, her mom told her to get out of there as soon as she could. So that is what she was trying to do. Of course, the officer didn't know what to expect at that point. He had no idea what was going on, so he did escort Sydney out of the home. 
At that point, Sydney elaborated, saying that she heard a glass window break, her mom told her to run, so she did. But when she returned back inside of the home, she found that her mom was hurt. When officers entered the scene and took a look around, they went into the back room of the home, and there they found Brenda lying on her back, covered in blood, barely clinging to life. Then lying on the ground next to Brenda, they found a cast iron frying pan as well as a kitchen steak knife. Then as police went further into the home, they found that there was a broken window and glass shattered all over. But what concerned them was the fact that the broken window was already covered in blood. At that point, first responders loaded Brenda into an ambulance and rushed her to the hospital, hoping to save her life. But unfortunately, 50-year-old Brenda did die from her injuries shortly after arriving to the hospital. It turned out that Brenda had suffered from multiple blows to the back of her head, and she had been stabbed at least 23 times, according to some reports, and other reports say as many as 30, mostly to her neck. She had been hit so hard on the back of her head that her scalp was also separating from her skull. She also had multiple injuries, such as cuts and bruises to her wrists and arms, which showed that she tried fighting her attacker. The medical examiner would later rule that Brenda died as the result of multiple blunt force and sharp force injuries. Now, after investigating the scene and finding out what exactly happened to Brenda, investigators quickly realized that whatever was going on here was not adding up to the story that Sydney was telling. Upon testing, they found that the blood on the broken glass window belonged to Brenda. Then, they found that Sydney had injuries all over her hands and she was also covered in blood. But that blood belonged to her mother, Brenda. So, it was clear that Sydney was involved in her mother's murder in some way. Brenda's blood was on the skillet as well as the kitchen knife, so it was clear that both were used to kill Brenda. So, based on what they found at the scene, police decided to take Sydney into the station for further questioning. Now, like I said, when first interacting with the police, Sydney was hysterical and crying. But after that, she would just lie still in the fetal position, absolutely catatonic, and refused to answer questions. At that point, police found out about all of the lies. The timeline, how she was kicked out of school, lying not only to her parents, but to everybody in her life about still being in school. She wanted so badly to avoid disappointing those around her and telling her parents what was really going on. So, when they found out and she was going to be caught for her lies, she decided to murder her mother. That is what police thought at that point. So, based on everything they found, Sydney was arrested and charged with the murder of her mother. At that time, Sydney pleaded not guilty due to reason of insanity. It was claimed that she dealt with severe mental health issues her entire life. She was diagnosed with multiple disorders throughout her life, and on the day of the murder, she just snapped and murdered her mother, and she had no idea what she was doing at the time. So, of course, because of these claims, Sydney was evaluated by multiple mental health professionals. While being evaluated by the first doctor, Sydney initially told them that she was in the basement when she heard the glass break. She then went upstairs to see what was happening, but then she blacked out. When she came to, the next thing she knew was that she was over her mother's body who had a knife in her neck and she was trying to help her. She told them that she doesn't remember much from that day, that she only remembers flashes. After the attack, she remembers sitting on the couch comforting her mother, then pacing up and down the stairs to and from the basement, wishing that she could just leave. Then, the next thing she remembers is being at the hospital. During one of these evaluations, she told the doctors that she started experiencing auditory hallucinations when she was 11. From there, she suffered from severe anxiety. From the time she was little, she was always very self-critical. She held herself to a ridiculously high standard and didn't want anyone to ever think that she was failing or that she wasn't good enough. If she was anxious about a test, she could sometimes get to the point where she really felt like she physically couldn't read the test. 
I will talk more about this aspect of things in just a minute. At the end of the evaluations, Dr. Anthony Smartnick diagnosed Sydney with schizoaffective disorder, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Smartnick was the main psychiatrist who she worked with after the time of the murder while awaiting her trial. Him diagnosing her with PTSD was because of the reported nightmares that she was having about seeing her mother covered in blood and dead. Another one of the main psychologists that she worked with and who we heard a lot from at the trial was Dr. James Reardon. Dr. Reardon also diagnosed Sydney with schizophrenia and major depressive. He believes that she has been experiencing auditory hallucinations since childhood, but that things got increasingly worse in the months before the murder. He believes that within the three to six months before the murder, she deteriorated. She began to lose touch with reality. She failed out of school. But she was so self-critical that the idea that she had of herself was not matching with the reality that she was facing, and she couldn't handle that. So, she felt that she couldn't tell anybody about her failures. It was all building with her being on academic probation, her being expelled, and then people around her starting to find out and starting to pick up the breadcrumbs that she left behind, all building like a wave until the day of the murder when the walls closed in on her so quickly and with such force that she completely snapped and had a psychotic break. She didn't know what she was doing when she murdered her mother. Now, after being arrested, she had her bond hearing, which was initially set for $250,000, but was raised to $500,000. She did end up posting her bail. Someone in her family, I believe, posted it for her. I'm not exactly sure. But she did live with her grandmother until her trial started. And again, I will explain more about that situation in just a minute. I also don't believe there were any competency hearings. As far as I was able to see, all of her psychologists thought that her having this psychotic break was in the months leading up to the murder and then after getting treatment after the murder, she seemed to be doing a lot better. So even though there were a few things they had to tweak with her treatment, she was able to stand trial. So the trial began on September 7th, 2023. 19-year-old Sidney Powell was being charged with two counts of murder. One murder charge meant purposely causing death, with the other being causing death that results from felonious assault. She was also charged with one count of felonious assault and one count of tampering with evidence, probably relating to her trying to stage the crime scene. She lied about her status at Mount Union University. She didn't let anybody know that she was on academic probation or that she failed out. She wouldn't let anybody know that she wasn't at school anymore and she wanted to avoid them finding out that she was actually coming home. The prosecution argued that these lies were starting to build and build until Sydney felt that she had no other option but to kill her mother in a fit of rage. The prosecution argued that when the attack started, she grabbed the closest thing to her, which was that iron skillet. She hit her mother multiple times, but when she realized that her mother hadn't died yet, she left the scene to grab a knife to stab her mother to make sure that she killed her. To them, that says that she at least had the state of mind to realize that what she was doing was not working, to separate herself from the scene, go get another weapon, and then come back and continue murdering her mother. You have to have some sort of awareness to be doing that. Then, after murdering her mother, she had the awareness to go to that window, punch it in herself to stage a break-in. She actually had to go outside of the house and around to that window, punch it in so it looked like somebody was breaking in. Her trying to cover her tracks like that shows that she knew that what she was doing was very wrong. We discussed a little bit about all the forensics that they found at the scene, that the blood on that window did belong to Brenda, which would make no sense if someone actually broke in. They obviously wouldn't have the blood of their victim on them already when they were just coming into the house. It was pretty much understood at this point that the entire scene was done by Sydney. There was really no other argument outside of this that Sydney was not responsible for this. They brought Michelle Gaffney and John Frazier to the stand to testify about the awful things that they heard on that phone call, which I'm sure 
traumatized them, especially once they realized what had actually been happening. They talked about when they heard Sydney begin to hit her mother with that frying pan. So what did you and Mr. John Frazier do once you received that voice message? So we, um, we were walking back together and we still had some work to do from the meeting we left and, and Dean Frazier said, why don't we just go to my office and make this call first? Okay. Um, so we, we went in his office um, and called the number on the, um, on the phone message that we were given and uh, Dean Frazier was sitting at his desk and I was sitting next to it. He, he dialed, uh, the phone was answered and um, Mrs. Powell answered. You say Mrs. Powell, is that Brenda who Brenda, answered? Brenda answered, yes. Okay. Um, and what did you tell Brenda at that time? So uh, Dean Frazier was, um, was speaking and, and simply said, um, Brenda, uh, this is Dean Frazier. I'm sitting here with Michelle Gaffney, our associate dean of students were returning your call and that's about as far as, as we got. Did Brenda respond to, to that introduction at all? Yeah. Okay. Yes. What did she I think, say? I think he asked, "Is this Brenda Powell?" Oh, okay. And she said yes, and he and then he identified himself. Okay. And Miss Gaffney, what happened next? Um, there was a very large or a very loud sort of thud sound, like a pound, a pounding or a thud, um, accompanied by a by a pretty loud scream, um, and um, the scream might have actually been first, and then the thud. Okay. As I think about it, and then um, there was sort of a an expulsion. The other sound that I heard at that same time, or, or right after, was sort of an expulsion of air, like the air was knocked out of somebody. Okay. Um, I, I, I'd always heard that expression of the air being knocked, you know, having the wind knocked out of you, but I didn't. That's actually what it sounded like. And then several more repeated thuds. I don't, I don't know how to describe the sound. No, and that's okay. And you could, you and Mr. Frazier could hear this from the other end of the phone. From the other, it was on speakerphone, right? Okay. Yeah. Did you hear any communication during these thuds? Just the screaming. Multiple friends and classmates of Sydney's all said that while she did have anxiety, she was acting like her normal self in the weeks and days leading to the murder. They did say that she was spending more time alone but overall, she was still the normal, social, bubbly girl that she had always been. They brought forward the text messages between Sydney and her mother, which shows the lies. They talked about the entire timeline of that day, from when Stephen found out about her lies to when the murder took place. They again discussed, after the murder, how she had the presence of mind to stage the crime scene after killing her mother. The prosecution also acknowledged how the defense's psychologists will say that Sydney was insane at the time of the murder. But they said that other psychologists found her stories to be somewhat inconsistent. There would be one day where she wouldn't remember one detail, but then the next day, she suddenly remembered. Some of these psychologists said that they couldn't rule out malingering, which is basically when a patient exaggerates their symptoms to make them appear worse. They called Dr. Sylvia Obradovich to the stand, who said that he diagnosed Sydney with borderline personality traits and unspecified anxiety disorder. Now, this is interesting because people with borderline personality traits are known to have a very unstable self-image. They are prone to extreme mood swings. They can have explosive periods of anger. They engage in self-destructive behaviors and often will show big gestures of emotion and drama to get attention. A lot of these traits actually do fit with what we know about Sydney very well. So basically, because of the doctor thinking that she had borderline personality disorder, she may have exploded into a fit of rage after her already unstable sense of self was being questioned by her parents. Dr. Obradovich believes that Sydney was also malingering her mental illness. He said that it is extremely rare to experience symptoms of hallucination from schizophrenia before the age of 13, especially in women whose symptoms typically occur from the mid to late 20s. But as we know, Sydney said that her symptoms started at 11. He just does not think this is accurate. He also called into question sort of how these diagnoses were made by the other doctors. Everything that they heard from her was retrospective. It was after the murder took place. So there's no way to tell for sure 
if Sydney truly experienced these things before the murder or if she just knows enough about what she needs to say that she could get diagnosed with schizophrenia, for example, so that she doesn't have to take accountability for what she did. There's no way to tell if she's malingering. There's no way to tell without documentation of any mental illness before the murder. There's no way to tell if she's being 100% truthful or if a lot of these symptoms happened after the murder, for example. Obviously, if this trauma added to her symptoms of schizophrenia and PTSD, a lot of people with schizophrenia won't have symptoms until they have a very traumatic event. So, we don't know if this traumatic event of killing her mother was what brought out the schizophrenia symptoms or if she had the symptoms her entire life, like she claims. He also doesn't believe that she could have had such bad symptoms for so long without anybody in her circle noticing anything. He agreed that Sydney's motive for murdering her mother was because she would have done anything to keep from disappointing them, no matter how extreme. She may not have been thinking clearly because of her borderline personality traits, but she knew what she was doing, she knew it was wrong, and she took the steps to try and cover it up. The defense, on the other hand, argued that Sydney was suffering from severe mental health problems that built upon each other until March 3rd when she just snapped. Of course, the defense brought forward multiple psychologists to testify on what they found with Sydney's mental health evaluations. One of them, and the most significant testimony, came from Dr. Reardon. Again, he said that Sydney's view of herself being different from her reality with her failing classes led her to extreme denial. She didn't want to recognize it. She wanted to push it away in whatever way she could. He said that near the end of November of 2019, she started to transition from more normal, very self-critical thoughts that a lot of people might have to distorted thoughts, which progressed to severe auditory hallucinations, which told her that she was worthless, that she didn't deserve to live, and that she was a failure. What her friend saw was not the reality. She may have been doing okay to the outside, but on the inside, she was starting to spiral. Eventually, she became withdrawn and stopped talking to friends or seeing them as often as she had. When it came to her acting normally in the days and weeks before the murders when she was around friends, it was basically argued that she wanted others to see her in a certain way, not allowing them to see her as a failure or as someone who has something wrong with them. Now, like I said, Dr. Reardon argued that Sydney did not know what she was doing when she was murdering her mother, but the prosecution explained that she knew enough to cover her tracks. Dr. Reardon said that the most important and relevant time in this situation was when the attack was actually happening. Using the cell phone data that we heard earlier, how Brenda was speaking with the school staff to when the phone hung up and Sydney answered again, that was all within the duration of about three and a half minutes. Those three and a half minutes are the most significant in this timeline. He states that she lost touch with reality for those three and a half minutes. During that time, she was incapable of reasonable thought. And after, she realized that she had lost touch and was trying to make sense of what was going on. So, she felt like she had to get away. That is why after the attacks, she at least knew enough to try and cover her tracks. So, three minutes and 30 seconds elapsed between those two phone calls and Detective Winnen told us that all of the acts that occurred that resulted in Brenda's death occurred within that time frame. Yes. I mean, in terms of assessing um, mental state at the time of the offense, information and evidence prior to those three and a half minutes uh, is relevant, but um, the, the most relevant span of time is those three and a half minutes. That, you know, what was her mental state at the time of the offense during those three and a half minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that the, a, a more likely explanation is that um, failing was not an option in her mind. Uh, I mean, in her mind, if, if she failed, then she was a failure. And I think that is when some of the early manifestations of thought disorder, um, some of the early um, auditory hallucinations 
were manifest, but again, she didn't seek or couldn't seek help uh, because you know if you're a successful graduate student athlete at Akron St. Vincent St. Mary's, you don't do that. Um, and uh, it was just, um, it was inconsistent with her picture of herself. And I, I think that things began to, it, it's kind of like a building wave, you know? And, um, and I think the wave really began to get out of control um, probably in November, December of 2019. I mean, by that time, she was, um, she was kind of hunkered down um, psychologically. And again, my, my opinion is that a lot of this is occurring within her but it's not that she's, you know, at the same time it's occurring, it's not consistent with who she's supposed to be. And so she just kept pushing it away and denying it and trying to not avoid it, or trying to avoid it and um, not recognize it. And again, I believe that it's very likely that at that point she was already, if she hadn't begun the process even earlier, probably, maybe even summer of 19, certainly during the fall of 19, she began to um, kind of cross the line from um, normal self-critical thoughts to, um, to significantly um, disordered thoughts to psychotic thoughts, including um, highly critical um, uh, uh, auditory hallucinations, you're worthless, you know, you're a failure, you don't deserve to live. Again, she did try to cover what she did, but you can also say that she did such a poor job that nobody in their right mind would think it would work. She answered a phone call pretending to be her mother, whereas most people would know that that would never work. She punched out that window after already having blood on her hands, making no attempt to clean herself off before doing that. She also didn't clean herself off before police arrived. She made up a story, but she pretty much did nothing to make it look like a convincing one. Another psychiatrist, Dr. Time, said that Sydney's case was a very unique one because the risk factors normally associated with mental health issues such as childhood trauma or a history of experiencing violence or substance abuse were all absent in her case. Again, like I said, a lot of people with schizophrenia will only show symptoms once they experience a big life event like their parents being divorced or starting college or something traumatic. He said that any psychotic break will come on gradually and diminishes over time. All the while, they do experience periods of lucidity, which is when Sydney would text her friends and her family to appear normal. Dr. Time believes that her psychotic episode began when the dean of the school told Sydney that she needed to vacate her dorm, which would make sense because that was a big life event and to her, it could have been very traumatic. So it makes sense that after that, if that's when schizophrenia symptoms started showing up. After that, while staying in hotels, she became increasingly paranoid, she lost track of time, and lost touch with reality. He believes that she was psychotic while murdering her mother. He points to her bumbling efforts after the fact. He said that her answering the phone pretending to be Brenda was not something that a normal person would do. It was obvious that the school would be able to tell that it wasn't Brenda once again, but Sydney was so overwhelmed by the trauma of what just happened that she wasn't making any sense. Members of school staff testified that they started to notice that she was starting to isolate herself and she did seem to be slowly deteriorating while in school. She did suffer from anxiety throughout her time in college, and other friends noticed this in high school as well. One of her teachers testified, Miss Milligan, who was her high school English teacher for three years. She described that Sydney was a standout student for many years. 
She thought so highly of Sydney and even wrote her a letter of recommendation to get into college. But there was one incident where Sydney came to her distressed and in tears saying that she couldn't see numbers. She was freaking out about an upcoming test and she had gotten herself so hyped up from anxiety that she physically felt like she couldn't read. So, to resolve the issue, Miss Milligan agreed to give her the test on a later date. This event was not reported to the school, though, because she didn't think it was severe enough to call it a mental health crisis or anything like that. So, to the defense, this showed that she had been suffering from severe mental health issues since she was a young teenager. To the prosecution, though, this said that even the staff around her who saw her anxiety didn't think it was severe enough to report it to anybody. Therefore, it couldn't have been that bad and probably wasn't schizophrenia. It was probably just normal anxiety that a lot of people experience. Sydney's grandmother also testified at her trial. Like I said, after being released from prison on bail, she stayed with her grandmother who lived on a farm and was able to help her and be with her pretty much 24-7 because she was retired. Now, since she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and depression, she was prescribed Abilify and Depakot, which are used to treat bipolar, Cymbalta and Trazodone, which are used for depression and anxiety, as well as Prazosin, used to treat nightmares. For the first few months, Sydney seemed glazed over and flat. So, it took a few tweaks on the medication to get it just right, but once she took her medications as prescribed and she got used to the routine, according to her grandmother, she improved significantly. Her mental processing improved, she started talking more, she was more expressive, and just overall looked better. She said that Sydney took her meds like clockwork, she was very responsible with seeing her counselor, and any time she experienced any breakthrough symptoms, she would always immediately notify her therapist. Through counseling and taking her meds, she became herself again. These things really helped her, and she seemed to be getting a lot, a lot better. Stephen, Sydney's father, also testified. He talked about, you know, obviously Sydney's lies and how they were starting to find them out, and then about the timeline of events of March 3rd, 2023 that led up to his wife's murder. I won't be repeating all of the details of this because I don't want to be too repetitive, but even with everything that happened, he said that Brenda and Sydney were incredibly close. There was no way that Sydney would want to hurt her mother like this. This happened, in Stephen's opinion, because Sydney was very mentally ill and she snapped. He truly believes that. The defense also had several other family members and friends testify to the close bond that Sydney and her mother shared. No one who knew Sydney believed that she would ever have chosen to kill her mother just to cover up her lies. And to take that even further, nobody in their right mind would think that killing their parent would cover up their lies. If she truly was in the appropriate mental state, there's no way that she thought that killing her mother was going to get her away from all of this. That literally does not make any sense. Throughout the trial, it was clear that Sydney was distraught. If you watched any of the trial coverage during a lot of the defense and prosecution testimony, Sydney was crying. She genuinely looked remorseful and upset for what happened. So, after seven days of arguments from both sides on September 18th, 2023, the prosecution and defense made their closing statements. After that, the jury was sent off for their deliberations. They deliberated for over two days before coming back with their verdict. By September 20th, 2023, the jury found that Sidney Powell was guilty on all charges, including two counts of murder, one count of felonious assault, and one count of tampering with evidence. When the verdict was read, Sydney was in disbelief and continued to cry hysterically. Verdict form number one as to count one reads, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled, sworn, and affirmed, do hereby find the defendant Sidney Powell guilty of the offense of murder as charged in count one. The form goes on to say, and we do so render our verdict upon the concurrence of 12 members of said jury. Each of us said jurors concurring in said verdict signs their name here to this 20th day of September 2023. Each juror has signed in ink next to his or her name. Verdict form number two 
reads, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled, sworn and affirmed to hereby find the defendant Sidney Powell guilty of the offense of murder as charged in count two. And we do so render our verdict upon the concurrence of 12 members of said jury. Each of us said jurors concurring in said verdict signs their name here to this 20th day of September 2023. Each juror has signed their name in ink next to their juror number. Verdict form number three reads, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled, sworn and affirmed to hereby find the defendant Sidney Powell guilty of the offense of felonious assault as charged in count three. And it reads, and we do so render our verdict upon the concurrence of 12 members of said jury. And finally, verdict form number four reads, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled, sworn and affirmed to hereby find the defendant Sidney Powell guilty of the offense of tampering with evidence as charged in count four. We've always believed it was purposeful killing uh, and the jury has agreed with that sentiment that it, she purposely did it. She wasn't doing it by accident and that she wasn't doing it because she was mentally ill. Um, and so we are, um, we believe they've confirmed our belief from the start in this case. After the verdict was read, of course, it was time for sentencing, which came a week later. Before her sentencing hearing, many, many people all wrote to Judge McLaughlin in support of Sydney, asking for a lenient sentence. In total, there were 58 pages worth of letters written by her father, aunts and uncles, friends of hers, friends of Brenda's and Stevens, all who believed that Sydney was not mentally well. I was able to read through most of them and I was able to learn a lot about Sydney, her parents and their relationship, but I do think that her father's is probably the most gut-wrenching and the most important out of all of them. In part, Stephen's letter reads, Brenda and Sydney shared an unbreakable bond that even now I believe is strong. Being the one person in the world that knew both of them better than anybody and as tragic as this is and nothing anyone can ever do will bring Brenda back and make my family whole again. I do not believe that anything other than the minimum sentence would truly be what Brenda would want to see. Since March of 2020, Sydney has been getting the help that she so desperately needed that neither Brenda nor I could see and has been keeping her required appointments and doing all the right things with her grandmother and the community at large. Sydney has been taking her medications as prescribed, meeting with her pretrial services worker and all her mental health professionals as prescribed. I firmly believe now that Sydney is properly diagnosed and treatment has been well underway for 3.5 years, her recidivism risk is zero. Sydney was always a very good child and was always a pleasure to be around. Sydney has been out in the community since her initial release and has no court-mandated requirements other than calling in weekly. I believe this shows her desire to admit her mental disease and to continue improve her mental health by following the plan of actions set by her team of doctors. While I think that the prosecutor's office and the jury got this verdict completely wrong, I would request that as you review this case, you find it appropriate to give Sydney a minimum sentence and send her to a stable mental health facility similar to the new mental health treatment center at the Ohio Reformatory for Women. I believe that since there can never be true justice in this case, Sydney's mental health should be our main priority. All of the other letters echoed the same sentiment, asking the judge for a lighter sentence for this tragic event all describing Sydney as a wonderful child and a wonderful person growing up until she was afflicted with this mental disease that caused this event to happen. By September 28th, 2023, a week after her verdict was read, Judge McLaughlin sentenced Sydney to 15 years to life for the charges of murder, as well as three years for the other charges to be served concurrently, so, Sydney must serve for 15 years before she is considered for parole. Ms. Powell, is there anything you want to say to me at this time? Okay. I, I have advised Ms. Powell that given the nature of her appeal, she should not make a statement today. And I understand that, but I have to give her the opportunity to do so. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, to the victims, to the family and friends, I am terribly sorry for your loss here. I cannot imagine what you have been through. I have received and read all of the letters that have been sent to me. I have considered the evidence that was brought into evidence um, at the trial, the statements of counsel, 
and all of the information that is before me at this time. I do find that counts two and three merge with count one for purposes of sentencing in this matter. Based upon the facts and circumstances of this case and in consideration of the relevant sentencing factors, including seriousness and recidivism, and applying the minimum sanction that the court has determined will protect the public and punish the offender without imposing an unnecessary burden on state and local resources, the court imposes the following sentence. On count one, ma'am, I sentence you to an indefinite sentence of 15 years to life in the Ohio Department of Corrections. On count four of the indictment, I sentence you to three years in the Ohio Department of Corrections. Those two sentences to be run concurrent with and not consecutive to each other. She could be out in her 30s, so I would say if she does get out in 15 years, that's a pretty good sentence for having murdered somebody. So that is where the case ends today. This was a very interesting case to follow from the beginning. I watched almost the entire trial from start to finish and I truly had no idea where this was going to go. I feel like this case is one of the most convincing cases that I have ever seen of someone truly having a psychotic break. I think for someone to go to the lengths that Sydney did to lie and manipulate those around her, you either have to be very mentally unstable or a complete narcissist. But then to murder her mother while she was on the phone and to show such a poor attempt to cover her tracks, that doesn't seem like somebody who's thinking clearly. Those of you who are regular viewers of my channel know that I call bullshit almost 100% of the time that someone tries to claim insanity, especially in cases where drugs are involved. That happened in a case that I just covered recently. It's either going to be posted right before this one or right after but when you guys see it, you'll know it. But based on what we know, Sydney was not involved with drugs. She was smart and she had a good normal upbringing and a good normal social life until one day everything came to a head. Everybody in her life supported her after she murdered her own mother who was loved by so many people, which is something that we don't see almost ever. But do I believe that she wasn't aware of what she was doing? Do I believe that she truly had a psychotic break? I don't know. I think it's clear that she either had a fit of rage and maybe after starting she couldn't stop, but that doesn't mean that what she did was justified. I have to say, I am happy with the sentence she got. I'm happy that she had to take accountability for what she did. I'm happy that she knows what she did and she is having to work through it. I am happy she got a life sentence, but this is a tough case because I'm someone who truly believes in victim rights and advocacy. When you see a family who is fighting for their loved one's murderer to be kept in jail and to never be released, it's a no-brainer that that person should never be released. But Sydney's own father, the husband of the person she killed, her grandmother, her aunts, uncles, close friends of Brenda's all believe in rehabilitation for Sydney. So to me, I can't say that I know any better than her own family. So if they want her to be released eventually, if she is better and no longer a danger to society, I hope that she is when she's better, when she no longer poses a threat to anybody or herself. I hope that she continues to get the help that she needs and in the end, I hope her family gets what they want out of this. You guys might disagree with me, but I'm in the camp on this one where I'm not going to push how I feel on the family. This wasn't my tragedy, this was their tragedy and they will feel how they want to and they're going to deal with it how they want to and if they want Sydney to be released eventually, I really hope that they get what they want. Obviously given that she's no longer a danger to herself or anybody else. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. This is a case where I really want to hear everyone's thoughts because I feel like everybody is going to have such differing opinions on this one. Do you think that Sydney was legally insane? Do you agree with a legal insanity plea? What do you think of the proposed motive? Do you think she actually murdered her mother to prevent her from having to face her mother's disappointment? What do you think of her sentence and what do you think of the support that she's getting from her family? Please sound off in the comments. I really want to know what you all 
think. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. All are going to be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.